I haven't, it's not like, no, I haven't finished the whole thing. I'm, I'm into stress, you know, it's really humiliating sometimes. <laughs> supposed to present you and that's also a little odd yes, given yes. that we're not in the same space but uh i'm just gonna go like fred hi fred how's it going how are you today i'm very well thanks how are you i am all right doing well doing well it's a saturday so it's a perfectly fine day for a glass of wine yeah, absolutely cheers. yeah you got one as well <laughs> cheers I do, I do. all right okay let's sip on it mm -hmm. what are you drinking there what kind of wine uh, you got I'm drinking some Chianti. What are you drinking? I got a, um, what do I got? I got Pinot Grigio. Um, mm. And uh, I haven't, it's not like, no, I haven't finished the whole thing. It's just not <laughs> me. I, mean, I do promise you that. It's been sitting in the fridge over the past few days. I've been sort of just like, um, you know, having one or two sips is mm. all. So, uh, but it tastes good. It tastes good. Are you like, are you, are you good with wines? Do you like, can you actually like make an elaborate comment on what you're drinking? Cause I've, I've never been able to do that. I can make it up, but, um, <laughs> but I can't, I can't say anything meaningful, um, but I do like wine. I'm getting, I'm sort of beginning to get into wine. So if you ask me again in a year, maybe I'll. Um, All right. I'll Noted. Share. Okay. I have a <laughs> mental note of that. Right. Coming back to you in a year. <laughs> Um, Fred, Fred is, um, a, a colleague of mine and, uh, we've known each other for, for, for how long now? I want to say two years. A couple almost. of years, I think. Yeah. yeah. All right. And, and, um, you want to, you want to tell everyone how we know each other? So what, where is it that you work? So, yeah, we work, um, together, um, at the London School of English. So I, I've been working there, um, for a few years and then um you started there um and, and that's how we met we were both teaching there the london school of english right so that's the place to go to especially it when is. you want want to be in a group of nice people in a very nice space so yeah, yeah absolutely okay. it's a good place to um to uh to learn but also to be surrounded by other learners and to sort of be on a be on a, a sort of journey together and the teaching is is good and the facilities are are excellent so right check it out <laughs> love it love it so you've been working um as an efl teacher that is english as a foreign language for for many years now i take it started um in uh may 2011 so okay. Mm -hmm. So coming up, coming up to 10 years, um, and I've been working at the London School of English uh, since April 2016. So I've, wow. been, I've been there for nearly five years. How'd you, how'd you get into EFL? My background um, is in theatre. I was um, 25 and I was working a bit as a writer. Um, but I needed some more regular income. I did um, a cert TESOL. The, the, the first qualification that you need to, um, to teach English professionally mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with um, Anthony Myers, in fact, was my teacher, who's a, a colleague of ours. Hi, Anthony. Uh, yeah, hi, Anthony. <laughs> and um, it, brilliant, brilliant teacher. I was still writing as well, and I still do write, but I started really enjoying the teaching. It was more more enjoyable, more fulfilling than I'd expected. And I actually moved um, and worked in Spain um, for a couple of years and came back to London and then started working at London School of English. Now I teach lots of general English, but lots of business English, lots of professionals. Um, London School of English is a particularly good place to go if you're, um, if you want to learn English for professional 
purposes. So I teach a lot of lawyers, um, finance people, and people from all sorts of different professional backgrounds. I really like teaching a variety of different people. And um, it's interesting teaching in an environment where everyone has a shared first language and a shared kind of cultural mm -hmm. background and where you're in a way kind of the outsider to that actually. <laughs> yeah, I think teaching in London, um, particularly you, um, you really get to meet some extraordinary mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and I hope help them, so. So then you've gotten to work with all kinds of people, age-wise, you know, uh, culture-wise. Mm. Um, well, would you say that there's um, a set of things that you as a teacher, you kind of wish every learner was more or less aware of in order to facilitate the process and get their, you know, where, wherever it is that they are willing to get as learners? Is there some sort of knowledge that you think you could sort of pass on through this interview for everyone to like be damn if I were doing that things would probably work better for me well I, I think that what people need to know is that there is no um magic uh pill obviously and 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 to get to where you want to be might we might want to be takes a very long time um and I encourage um people to be um, ambitious. I think you should be really ambitious. Uh, you also need to manage your expectations in the short term as well and not be hard on yourself. I think the people who, who do well more easily are people who know how to manage their expectations, have high standards for themselves, but not impossibly high standards. It helps when people um, are willing to embrace ambiguity mm -hmm. um, and the fact that things are complicated in English, you know, you can ask what you think is a simple question, um, but maybe there isn't a simple answer. It helps if, if you can um, accept that. If you always want to know why, 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 that's good to a certain extent, but there's a limit to how useful that is. And I think that with a language, you can be analytical, or you can be more instinctive and you need to sort of nurture both sides mm -hmm. of that it's a bit of a false dichotomy you know, for me for example I'm a very analytical person a very analytical learner listening is always my weakest skill analytical aspect I'm good at already sort of naturally but I need to sort of balance out and 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 um work on my instincts but for other people it's the other way around it helps when you realize that language is um imperfect um and you know even people speaking their first language you know can't always express themselves mm -hmm. very well even if they are you know if they appear articulate or eloquent you know they're not always saying exactly what they want to say it's not like everyone who speaks a language is in a club of um, people who can do it and you're outside trying to to get in you know we're all in the in the same boat to some extent and they were all trying to to make the language work for us as for us as best we can just try to relax <laughs> right right i mean that's that's one one place to start for sure um cool okay and then as far as that willingness to work on that sort of more feeble not as that, that side of yours that is either uh not so analytical and not as instinctive as you wish it were like how do you work on that side that is not your strongest suit and yet if it were there and it was more balanced it would would, would sort of um help build a more complex holistic approach to the process so how do you work on that other side you think it's, it's difficult and, and I don't always practice what I preach. I tell people they should get out there and, and when someone speaks back to you or when mm -hmm. someone speaks to you, don't, don't try to analyze every single word, but be satisfied with getting the, the basic point or getting the general idea. I think 
you, you got you got to plow through. So, for example, if you're if you're in the UK as as a learner and um, you're using English every day, the conversations that you have in English are real conversations, you know. And the the other person isn't marking your work, you know. <laughs> they care about the message that you're that you're getting across and getting their own message across to you. So, if you manage to to negotiate that transaction successfully mm -hmm. um that's great and that's all you need to do and then you know you, you can get confidence from that and and move forward it, it helps to be nice to yourself in that way <laughs> and to and to um recognize things that have gone well even if you haven't um dotted every i and crossed every t mm -hmm. oh, that's an excellent expression i love it <laughs> that's that's fair so kind of negotiating those um, I guess, combinations and proportions of ones being analytical and more intuitive um, and kind of going with the flow and relaxing into it, even when it, it's, it seems impossible or what? It's, di it's difficult as well, because it's embarrassing. I think that's, that's a, a, another thing that, that we don't talk about enough is the fact that learning another language or using another language, which you're not comfortable with, is, is really humiliating sometimes, <laughs> or you feel- It can be, it, right. You know, you know, when I was in Spain and my Spanish, um, uh, particularly at first, wasn't very good. You know, every situation was um, stressful. Every time I went to the shop and um, and asked for something, it was you know I had to build myself up to do it because it was just so yeah. it was it was embarrassing. I felt silly a lot of the time. Um, humiliating is maybe a little strong, but <laughs> but maybe, maybe not. Like I think there are times when you do. You know, you can allow yourself to feel really stupid at times and, and really everyone's in the same boat. Because uh, it seems like a lot of people are um, kind of missing out on, on the joy of, you know, the very notion of trying. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, it's well, cool to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and and I think you need to find pleasure in, in that. And... Yeah, like when you when you're learning a, a new language or using a new language, you're sort of opening up a new side of yourself, kind of creating it, maybe opening up or maybe creating a new uh, a new part of yourself, a new identity. Um, yeah. And it's and it's fun and liberating. And maybe maybe that new identity is is sort of smaller than your identity in your first language. Mm -hmm. it's a bit oppressive you know living with mm -hmm. your, yourself and your thoughts mm -hmm. and your, your first language and I think to sort of take yourself out of that I like that so then, so then as a Spanish learner um so so what's your story there you, you you've learned Spanish in Spain outside of Spain Spanish I um hadn't learned um at all really until I went to Spain. I did, I did a, few, a few lessons here in, in London, but not much. But I went there partly because I wanted to do something different, but also I wanted to um, put myself in the position of the learners that I sort of deal with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here. So you've experienced, you know, this, this whole context of being taught as opposed to teaching. So you've, you've mm -hmm. been on the other side and you still are. So was there anything um, that you appreciated about the way you were taught uh, at one particular point in time with one particular teacher? Or what was your experience with that? Everyone's experienced good teachers and um, teachers who weren't so good for you. What I like is um, a few things, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I like people who um, understand how difficult things are for their learners mm -hmm. um, and are able to empathise or willing to empathise, um, but who also have high standards, you know, mm -hmm. people who expect a lot from you. I like teachers who get you to speak a lot, you know, in whatever situation, particularly, particularly at low levels, at right. lower levels. I like people who make you not make you speak but encourage you to speak when when English teachers start teaching I think that we're encouraged to um to let the learners speak as much as possible 
speak minimally ourselves, not speak much ourselves at all, really. That's a kind of um, um, rule of thumb. Yeah. That and that's should. hard for some people. <laughs> right? it's, it's incredibly difficult. It's, it's really, really difficult because I think particularly when you're teaching lower levels, the more you yeah. teach, the, wor- the more you talk, the worse it goes to, to speak or um, when it's valuable to, to do so or to, or to really um, get into things when it's appropriate to do so, not kind of um, skim over the issues. And I think sometimes, sometimes for, for teachers, um, you can get quite good at making things superficially go well. I love that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I think I do, right. But then what, what do you think, how um, how is that reflected in, in you know, the results or um, the process, that sort of superficial progress? What, what I mean is, is, is that you sort of, um, you know, you have a, a class, everyone's spoken a lot, everyone seems happy, you've achieved mm-hmm. a lot, but you haven't, but, but, but um, maybe no one's actually learned anything. Right. Um, it's the worst feeling ever. <laughs> as, as a teacher or as a, as a, as a teacher, as a learner, as a learner. Oh my goodness. I'm such a like demanding judgmental learner because the teacher, you know, well, I mean, there's, there's two modes and as a learner, I'm always like sort of observing what the heck it is that they're doing. And I mm. can't help but just, be like mm, that's that's interesting that that's something I might actually consider doing myself and you know on, on the other side of the spectrum it's like what the heck what on earth is this person doing and how am I supposed yeah. to like deal with it and and how do I um how do I benefit from it so I do go a little crazy judgmental on them but on the inside yeah. I never never voice it <laughs> no I'm the same as you I think <laughs> and then and is there any particular part of language, like the, you know, the, the complex system that it is, is there any hmm. part of it that you enjoy teaching more than others? In terms of grammar. Yeah. I, I like, I like teaching um, things like conditionals and relative clauses. Uh-huh. Because, Why is that? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because there's, there's, they appeal to me on the sort of analytical level and there's a logic right. to those structures. In terms of skills, I like teaching listening right. um, because I think it's um, an area that's often neglected. Okay. Um, and also because it's my own weakest area as a learner. It's, it's a skill that's often neglected and it's an area where I feel like I can make a difference, I can help with it. Yeah. And also pronunciation, which I think it's often neglected, I think. And there are some, there, there, there are, um, I'm, I'm I'm into teaching, I'm into stress. I, I'm into stress and um, I'm into um, expo- like exposure to not just connected speech, but to real usage. Encouraging people to, to engage with the rhythm of the language. You know, the mm-hmm. fact that English is a, is a stress time language, not a syllable mm-hmm. time language. The mm-hmm. fact that, that so many of so much of what people have learned in terms of pronunciation needs to be unlearned uh-huh. um, or replaced. So, you know, all the, all the weak forms that we have. Because um, mm-hmm. I think stress is often the key to, um, to clarity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I, individual sounds, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's nice to, to improve your pronunciation of individual sounds, certainly in terms of your confidence in yeah. saying the word. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I think it's often, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's, that getting the stress wrong, mm-hmm. word stress, but also sentence stress, um, can actually derail what you're saying and, and really confuse the other person. So if you can get the stress right, mm-hmm. um, or stress the appropriate words yes. in the appropriate way, Mm-hmm. That, that makes a massive difference so mm-hmm. I think it's I, I like it because I think it's an area in which um you know not that much input mm-hmm. can yield really um good results but then you know some might say um that it's kind of like learning to play an instrument like the piano 
and you like you haven't really learned how to place your hand properly but you're already working on um you know like the phrasing and uh the way you move the rest of your arm <laughs> and and it's kind of like you know sort of jumping the gun and just sort of like going a little faster than you're supposed to so like there's that you know foundation sort of missing yeah it can often be a mystery to people as well why why some why hasn't this person understood you know i've right. used the correct form mm-hmm. you know the um my word choice is good. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I pronounce, I, th- I feel like I've pronounced everything perfectly. Right. Um, and still it hasn't quite, some, something's gone wrong. And, and, and often I think the answer, the, the key to that lies in, in, in stress. When, when we teach um, new language, we talk about form, meaning and pronunciation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But pronunciation is the bit that's often missed i i love i love drilling can't. right so it's can't 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 right super when you've got a room of you know people who had never expected to be doing that and you're you know but <laughs> it's fun it's fun and it's useful not just individual words but particularly drilling phrases Okay. Can, can you give me an example of a, of a phrase and how you drill it? Just like, I don't know, like a one minute drill. Well, even just that's an example of a phrase, an example yeah. of a phrase, an example of a phrase. Mm-hmm. You know, um, thinking about where the stress is, an example of a phrase. So the other, other. So I would drill other, other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, or other phrase, other phrase, other phrase. Okay. Um, or an example, well, an example is not so interesting, but it's quite interesting because there's, there's, there's the linking between the consonant and the Absolutely. Vowel. Little secrets, right, that sort of, that, that make, that, that they mutate all the freaking time and, and it just results in a totally different sound, d- different quality of sound. And once you actually explain the, you know, the intricacies and you explain the logic behind the mutations, the changes and how the sounds are originally, you know, the students are like, whoa, that's like, that, that, that changes everything. So I actually do want to, to change them in order to be understood. For starters encouraging people to notice mm-hmm. you know, noticing i think is really important and you can notice cool like cool vocabulary or like an interesting um grammatical point noticing how something is actually being pronounced do you have expressions or words that you are currently in love with? Like you love to use them because they're on point or because of how they sound or because of what they do, unlike some other words in other languages. Can you think of something off the top of your head? Um, Off the top of your head, that's good. (laughs) good. Um, (laughs) um, Yeah, I don't know. I I find it hard always to talk about sort of specific, Mm -hmm. uh, specific words or specific phrases. Um, there, there are some words that I, that I don't like. Um, okay, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. I really dislike the word portion. <laughs> I love it. Are you kidding me? I overuse it all the time. What's wrong yeah, with portion? I, tell me, tell I'll, me. What's I'll up? really try to avoid using portion. Because I was talking about that, sh- that or sh. Or sh. So it's the phonetic quality or of it that sort of... It's, yeah, it sounds kind of greedy. <sighs> portion. Portion. My favourite sound in English um, is mm-hmm. my, my favourite yeah. phoneme. Okay. Is O. Is that so? The, the, the diphthong. <laughs> yeah, is that so? <laughs> which is which is a really difficult sound for a lot of people, I think. Um, so I like lots of words with that sound in them, okay. like float. Okay. Or um, commotion. Okay. Or ocean. O oh, sounds a bit like a kind of um, mm-hmm. like a sail, like a sail filling filling with wind or something. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Vowels, you know, are the sounds that help us express emotion, right? Feeling like they are the ones that you um, convey what it is that you're feeling through. And and it's like when I say I want to go home, that's neutral. But once I go on and say I want to go home, 
it's the O, which you're so fond of, that I convey that sort of sadness and discomfort through. It's not the H, not the M, not the consonants surrounding it, but it's the central vowel in that one word that you emphasize towards the end of the sentence. So. And, and, and also because we have um, so many vowel sounds in English compared to some other language, many other languages. I think English is quite a beautiful language. Um, oh yeah, I'm with you on that. Mm -hmm. You know, and particularly the fact that it's stress timed and it has that kind of inbuilt musicality is naturally kind of um, iambic. That's a weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong. Um, yeah, that's yeah. It's a beautiful language. I think I think a lot of our vowel sounds are quite um, quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was Fred Gordon, everyone. <laughs>